Announcements. Oh, wow. In case you didn't notice the uh, offering box, we're using that today to speed things along. Um, we have a chili cook-off next week. Is that going to be fundraiser, vote, vote by putting money in? Yep, so uh, bring your appetite and your cash. Uh, also, I fall into this bucket. I've got a college student care packages. I think that uh, exam times are coming up, so any donations you can make to those outgoing care packages, I think those will be sent out in the next couple weeks. Uh, are there any other announcements? I'm sure we, yes. Do we have a, you speak louder. <laughs> um, Mission Board has decided for the Giving Tree this year, we're gonna do Santa Claus Girls. So starting next week, you'll be in the announcements. But as soon as the Giving Tree goes up, we will have tags on there, what items they're looking for, and I will deliver them by December 4th. We have an announcement way up front here. We just wanted to thank everyone for their generosity when we were trick-or-treating for chickens last week. With your support, we will be able to supply chickens for eight different families who are living in poverty. The gift of chickens will give them a source of protein and plenty of eggs to sell in the market, plus they can breed more chickens. If there's no other announcements, I think the Craig boys are very eager, yes they are, to ring the bell and let the community know we're in service. Yep, go ahead. Please join me in the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletins. There are times when our lives feel empty. Yet God is patient and listens to our cries. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on each one of us. Uh, the opening hymn is God of All Ages, whose almighty hand is uh, red, uh, in your red hymnals, 728. We're going to be doing verses 1 and 3.
we are trying to get prepared because we have a bumper crop this year. Um, we have a lot of names to uh, read for All Saints Sunday, uh, and we're excited about that, but uh, we're trying to make the process um, transparent. What we would like you to do, um, either, I guess it doesn't have to be yet when you hear your loved one's name, but if you, uh, if you want to come and light a candle in remembrance of someone, uh, you may come forward up the trial, and uh, if you would like to choose one of the candles, and um, Amy and Paul will have the candles lit to light them from. Tip your candle toward the lit candle, please. Don't have them tip into yours. And then take your candle that you lit and start on the top shelf in the center and move out from there so that nobody gets burnt along the way <laughs> and, and that we don't have like a, a drop or something. I don't want to be up here doing this. Uh, so, all right, um, excuse me. And I have a few names that did not make it to the list, so I'll start with those before I start uh, with the printed list. Jack Lemon. Marianne Vidal. Carol Vidal. Robert Vidal. Pat Dumond. Nancy Cortez, Karen Malone, Mark Stowe, Alberta Ahrens, Henry Lyon, Dan Shattuck Sr., Teresa Scott, Iris Bean, Pete and Louise Rice, Harvey and Angie Brink, Irabelle Word Rice, Mary Sue Tapscott Gentry, Bethel Crame, Ruth Crame, Ken Stoner, Marvin and Edith Schaub, Franklin Curtis, Karen Schaub, Sally Pollock, Joshua Gillette, Geraldine Gillette, Marguerite Pollock, E. Pearl Johnston, Belle E. Messina, Ken Johnston, Louis M. Messina, Gerald J. Kozacek, Daniel Ruby Coster. Judy Myers Nelson's mother also, Gardner and Pauline Jones, Maurice and Marie Newell, Robert and Betty Birdsall, Donald and Barbara Johnson, Charles and Barbara LeBaron, Mick Lester, Peg Ralston, Douglas Galloway Tite Jr., Sean Kelly, Jeremy Kelly, Shirley Miller, Steve Campbell, Neil Spink, Lauren W. Moss, Rhea S. Moss, Jim and Sally Patterson, Robert Van S., Sue Van S., Robert Wendell Phillips Jr., Bonnie Jean Phillips, Helen Uren Hessler, Charles Uren, Bruce Skyver, Roger Springblood, Ed and Tressa Springblood, Marvin Conendike, John Tenhave, Marion Tenhave, Elizabeth Galloway, 
Christian Sobrian, John and Fenna Tenhave, Emo and Nellie Van Halsema, Fred Van Horn, Emma Van Horn, Dr. Alan Parker, Ben Teverbaugh, Nathaniel McCarty, Elsie McCarty, Paul McCarty, Bob McCarty, Marjorie Wallace, Corden Wallace, Roy and Maxine Whittle, Glenn Burns, Ione Burns, Noreen Elkins, Larry Elkins, Arlo Elkins, Frank Zenk, Grant and Mildred Rice, Frank Sr. and Velma Zank, Anna Wheeler, Ford and Jenny Mae Stevens, Emmett and Florence Thomas, David Delano, Robert Whitman, Roma Appel, Chris Laraway, Ralph Appel, Clyde and Margie Johnson, Betty Woolley, Michael Woolley, Ronald Schaub, Virgil and Louise Phelps, Corey Palazzolo, Jean Minion, Lee Minion, Robert Kelly, Ricky Russolo, Dorothy Weinbeek, Adrian Weinbeek Sr., Bernice Nacken, Howard Nacken, Mary Ann Tyke, Nancy Jane Hardy, Eugene Justima, Margaret Justima, David Robbins, Susan Klein, Will you join me in prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we have just lifted up a list of your children, of children from our families, of parents, brothers and sisters from our families. When we read these names, we remember these people, and we ache at their loss. Lord, we know that they are yours and that you love them as much and more than we do. We ask you to be with us as we remember, and we ask you to welcome them home to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kind of a switch. Now can we have the children come up, please, but not up by the flames. I would like the children to be in the aisle because we are going to get active and we don't want to get active by all of those. So I know you're limber enough. Can you just sit down where you are for just a minute? Okay. Does anybody here know the scripture John 3.16? Gotcha, didn't I? Okay. So we're going to... I know it, don't worry, it's okay. Now we just lit all of these candles and we were sad for a moment, right? 
we're sad remembering these people that died. And my mom's name was on there. So I get a little sad thinking that my mom's not here anymore because she used to sit right there with us. But John 3.16 says, For God so that he gave his only begotten son, his only son, God gave his only son so that so that all who believe in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. What's that mean? Where are we? Are we ever going to see those people again that we named? Give me a head nod. Go for it. Yes, what that verse means, and I know I used the old version, but that's what I memorized it with when I was a kid. What that verse means is that all these people that we are sad that are not with us in person, that we can't see anymore, when we go to heaven because we believe, we're going to see these believers up there. Okay? So instead of, yes, it's okay to be sad that these people are not with us anymore. But it's also okay to be happy that we know where we're going to see them again. So I have a song for us. Would you stand up again? Now, I think we have kids here, and we're going to spread out down the aisle, and we're going to ask all, all the other people to stand up. We're going to spread out a little bit because we need some room. I think we have some kids here that have had dance lessons. True? I think we have some kids here that maybe haven't had dance lessons. Right, Thomas? Yeah. You know what? This song is talking to everybody. So, on your feet, folks! Hey!
Sunday school. Thank you, adults. I saw you moving. Scripture reading today is Luke 20, 27 through 38. It can be found in your Pew Bibles on page 855. Some Sadducees, those who say there was, is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. The second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. This is the word of the Lord. 
So, just everyone who was dancing, you don't have to be freaked out that uh, everyone just saw you on camera because our live stream link died on us. Um, <laughs> so we're recording it. It's going to post late. But uh, as we read this passage, it seems kind of a weird one, right? Like, what does it mean? Why is this here? Also, Kenzie's got a lot of work to do because I made her a, a presentation to try and track with. Uh, so you probably notice it's, it's kind of weird, it's kind of confusing, uh, but this was what was listed as our lectionary passage for today. And it's kind of fitting, it deals with uh, what happens in the afterlife, what happens next. Um, and so it lends itself well to the remembering of the saints, but it's also a passage that kind of gives me a chance to talk a little bit about uh, theology. Uh, so instead of kind of last week we had those main takeaway points, uh, this week, we're going to kind of look at a framework of how we can um, engage questions as people of God. Uh, but first, let's kind of understand what the passage says and means. So, Kenzie, next slide. We didn't come up with a good, like, switch the slides thing. Uh, so, some of the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. So, I should also note here that in trying to make this understandable, there's a lot of different versions of scripture. There's even going to be one where I just paraphrased it. So know that, that if you're trying to follow along, words might be different. Uh, so notice that there is an added detail there, that it's the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection. Um, that's kind of an important thing. Why is that added there? What is that supposed to make us think? And so that's what you should draw from that. We're often used to seeing the Pharisees. We often hear that word, but this is the Sadducees. They're also a um, section of Jewish thought at the time. There's Pharisees, Sadducees, there's also Essenes. So it's just kind of, think of it kind of like denominations, what they believe and how it differs. And so who are the Sadducees? Next slide, Kenzie. Uh, one is that they do not believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. Along with that, they don't believe in any spirits or angels, heaven, hell. They don't believe in any of that. So that kind of sets them apart from most of the other uh, sects of Judaism. Uh, next is that they deny kind of tradition. So it says they deny the divinity and consequently the authority of the oral law. So what is passed down to them from people speaking? Uh, you know, we get like the Ten Commandments, but then there's also the 630 plus laws they don't believe all of that. They don't believe what the rabbinic tradition says to them. And so along with that is that they only believe in the teachings of Moses. They only believe in the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. Those are really the things that set them apart, what we know of them anyway. Um, there's not a lot known about the Sadducees. Otherwise, maybe we would hear more of them in Scripture. But that is what we do know. And so, next slide. Uh, they come to Jesus with this question. So they refer to him as teacher. So notice that. They give Jesus respect, that they're honoring who he is. It says, teacher, Moses wrote in the Hebrew scriptures that a man must marry his brother's wife, and the new couple should bear children for his brother if his brother dies without heirs. And so you see that they're quoting from Deuteronomy 25.5. That's where this is coming from. So they're giving honor to Jesus by calling him teacher. They're also quoting from their own what they believe to be scripture. They're not using other parts of the Old Testament. So nothing seems out of the ordinary quite yet. Um, but here's where it gets a little fishy. I think this is a hypothetical question. Some people don't. Um, but they say there's a woman who has, marries a man. He dies with no heir. She marries the brother. This happens you know, seven times. All of the husbands die giving her no heir. And the woman then dies, still having no heir. See, the Sadducees give a story of a woman who's married a man and all of his brothers. She's still left without the future. Of, Here's how we carry on as our, as our family. And so was there really a woman like this? Probably not. There probably wasn't somebody who is still living this, um, this law, but they're, they're bringing it up. 
And so they're trying to describe one potential woman's experience, and, though, and then they ask their question. And they say, here's our question. In the resurrection, uh, whose wife will she be? Will she be the wife of seven men at once? And so in this question, they say, in the resurrection. Just a few verses ago, we just read that they don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, so we know that they're trying to trick Jesus with this question, but Jesus is ready, and so he responds. He answers their question, he takes it seriously, and he says, marriage is a major preoccupation here, but not there. So it's important here in our life, where we're living in this realm, but not in the next. He says, those who are included in the resurrection of the dead will no longer be concerned with marriage, nor, of course, with death. They will have better things to think about if you can believe it. And so that's Jesus' response to their question. But then he goes on. So he answered their initial question, and then he says, but since you brought it up, since you brought up the, the issue of resurrection, even Moses made it clear in the passage about the burning bush that the dead are in fact raised. After all, he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By Moses' time, all of them are dead. But God isn't the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. And so how do we engage the question and the asker? Well, it's to take the question seriously. But beyond just taking the question seriously, what are they asking? Why are they asking it? Jesus took that trick question seriously. He gave them an answer to their question. He could have blown them off. He could have ignored them. He could have said, that's, that's a useless question. But instead, he answered it. He thought more about it. He gave them an answer but he gave them an answer that was underneath their question as well. They're concerned with, what about the resurrection? How do we live on? And that's what Jesus answers, that God is the God of the living. And so maybe they wanted hope that they live on regardless of having offspring uh, in my life. I asked Kenzie if I could tell this, and she said yes, so know that I'm not just picking out stories. But often, I'll, I'll pick her up, we'll, we will have chicken, it's thawed in the fridge, we have a meal plan ready, and we still get in the car, and one of us will say, so what's for dinner? That's not a question of what are we eating tonight? We know what we're supposed to eat. It's a question of can we go out to eat? Can we have something else? And so answering the question of what's under the question. So it's, that's how we take the question seriously, but also understand what's under it. Uh, next would be to speak the truth in a way that the asker, the person asking, can understand. Jesus uses the text and the person that the Sadducees uh, believe in, that they're, they're using the Torah, they're talking about Moses. So he engaged them in a way that they could connect with. And so if you were engaging with someone who doesn't believe in Christianity, who doesn't think that God exists, who doesn't believe in the Bible, that it's not accurate, you're probably not going to use the Bible to prove your point. It's often used when you get into apologetics, but that's not the framework that they're looking at. So engaging the person in a way they can understand. And so in all areas of life, maybe it's a teenager wondering why they can't go to a party. Maybe it's kids wondering why they can't eat all of their Halloween candy at one time. And oftentimes the answer of because I said so doesn't really work. So um, we really have to think of this as a, a framework. And so there's what's called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's named after John Wesley, kind of just as a tradition. It has nothing really to do with him. It has nothing to do with even Methodists, but it's a good framework that a lot of people in theology are gonna use. And so it starts with scripture in that first corner. So what does the Bible say about a topic? What does it say about an issue? Our first thought on how we make decisions as people of faith should be, what does the Bible say? What can we know? This has to include proper context though, proper study, proper uh, language looking at. Uh, so understanding it as it was intended to be understood, not just picking what we want to see, not just trying to fit it to however we believe. The Bible, for instance, it doesn't mention guns. But it does mention weapons, it mentions peace, it mentions war, it mentions how to treat other people. And so we can use um, kind of an understanding of where we are 
and place that on scripture, more scripture placed on our lives today. So that's where we should start. The next one is tradition. And this is where we think of um, what does the early church believe? What has been passed down to us? Uh, what is even in our own tradition of we just celebrated All Saints Day? That's a tradition that's been passed down and we understand why we believe those things. Uh, it also looks at councils, it looks at creeds. So people who have studied these things, talked about it, and it's been passed down to us. Uh, even denominational traditions. So this, there can be variations here. People, you know, communion is a big one of what do we believe about communion? Does the bread and the juice physically turn into the body and blood? Is it more of a symbol? Uh, baptism is another one. Infant baptism versus adult believer baptism. And so traditions can, can fluctuate and Christians can believe different things uh, based on that. Uh, the next one is reason or logic. So this is what makes sense. Does it line up with the natural order of things? Uh, I think this one is how did we handle COVID as a church? Knowing that here's this virus that's here, how, what is a safe way to, to, to practice this? And we, so we did distance. We did masking even when we came in person. And so we looked as that is our reason, that this reasonable to distance and um, it didn't go with our tradition. And so it wasn't ideal, but we chose to worship virtually for months. And then when we returned, we thought safety. That's kind of what that reason framework lines up with. Uh, the next one is experience. And this is probably the one we're most familiar with. So what's been my experience to a situation, uh, for instance, with communion, maybe someone has taken it with a loved one that is no longer here. Maybe you took it on a special day. Um, maybe you took it on your wedding. And so communion is going to be a very important thing because of your experience with it. Other people might have a take it or leave it approach because they don't have that experience. Uh, experience is also cultural though. Uh, one example would be the differing culture of you know, parents and teenagers and how you interact with technology. We all kind of um, think differently because of our own experience, both culturally and personal. And so the example from our scripture, the question asked of Jesus, it was founded in scripture. Everything was based around that scripture in Deuteronomy 25, five. So Jesus also responds with scripture and his example with Moses. Tradition, it was used that the woman being married to the seven brothers, it was also tradition of what the Sadducees believed they ignored the oral tradition, the oral law. Reason was used when Jesus explains that God is not the God. He's not was the God, but he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's kind of a reason, um, logic of the words used there. And then the experience was used in the case of this woman. One woman's story helped shape the question and the belief of the Sadducees, of here is what we would say. And so, one more slide, Ken. So while the chart prioritizes scripture and tradition, we often, back a slide, flip it. Uh, we put our experience at the top and we put scripture last. So a better way to think about it is the next slide. So each of the three, the tradition, the reason, experience, are all encased and illuminated by scripture. The quote that often goes with this framework is that the living core of the Christian faith was revealed in scripture, illumined by tradition, vivified, which is alive and animated, in personal experience and confirmed by reason. Scripture, however, is primary. And so the last slide, Ken. So when we engage questions, we are engaging with people who have a longing and a desire. We must not simply say that we're right. We must not ignore the person. We can't just say because the Bible says so. Instead, we have to use wisdom and humility to engage others, to learn from their perspectives. What do their traditions say? What can we gain from hearing the experiences of others? How can we be humble? How can we solidify the core of our beliefs? How can we be loving to others? 
Show humility, grace, interest, and care. Despite this, despite Jesus and the Sadducees not agreeing on the resurrection, they were still able to say, well said, teacher. And so when we can engage people well, we might not agree, but at least we can have like, civility. At least we can have acceptance of one another. And I think this is going to be very important for us as a church, both for how do we hire a new pastor? What are we looking for as a pastor? Looking to scripture, what does it say about pastors? It's going to be important of how we vote, because people are going to disagree. People are going to need to know why we voted a certain way, um, as well as showing the community this is why we voted a certain way, both as our church voting, as elections for Michigan are coming up this week. All of this, as how we think of our, our beliefs as Christians, should be shaped. Think of it through that, that lens of the quadrilateral or um, even that, that last photo of Scripture encasing all of those. Uh, dear God, we, we thank you for today. We thank you for the wisdom of your, of your words. We thank you that we can disagree and still be connected to you, that we can be uh, people of humility, that we can be people who have open minds to hear others' experiences and to share our own. Help us to keep that humility in all of the decisions that we as individuals and we as a community will make together. Give us guidance, give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So we continue our worship with prayers of joys and concerns. Does anyone have one they would like to share? There's a mic coming around. Uh, Kyle, my son, is having his last eye surgery to correct the... Um, accident that he had a year and a half ago so his surgery is this week uh, for a, cat a simple cataract surgery but it finally his um, with uh, eyesight hopefully will be intact lord in your mercy I'd like prayers for my neighbor's mother. Her name is Mary. She's 100 years old, but she collapsed on a Friday and ended up in the hospital. Um, they think it's dehydration, but she also has Alzheimer's, so it's hard to tell whether it's really the disease or if it was dehydration. Lord, near mercy. I would like prayers for my great-grandson, great -grandson, who's four weeks old. 
and is suffering from RSV. The Lord in your mercy. I want to thank the congregation for their prayers for my friend Pat. They worked. She came through the surgery well, and thank God they got all of the cancer. Lord, in your mercy. Continued prayers for our friend John, who's battling pancreatic cancer. Lord, in your mercy. see any others so let's, let's pray Lord we are people who want instant answers to all of our questions we want to know how everything is going to work out um, so we pose questions in which we do not necessarily seek the answers of but we rather try to entrap you try to entrap you into giving us what we want. Help us to understand the broader picture, the, the scope of your faithfulness and love for us. Remind us of all the times when you've lifted us and you have brought us to new opportunities for learning and growing. Let us place our trust in you totally without reservations, for you are indeed faithful and just. As we have brought our prayers before you for loved ones and for situations in the world in which pain and anger dominate, let us place our trust in your response and your healing love. Give us courage that our faith will be a witness to those who struggle and that our lives will bear the love that you have lavished on us. And together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, We now move to our celebration and remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, this is a place and a time where all people are welcomed to join. Uh, this is a table, is a place where all are unified and all our equal. We need only to accept the invitation from our Messiah. Let us pray. We pray to you, holy God, to transform us, to unify us, and to refresh us. Forgive us our unrighteousness, and our faults as we join with one another in this meal. Bless this bread that was broken and this cup that was poured out for us. Allow this meal to join us together and to teach us to be a people of peace, a people of you. Amen. As the servers come forward, uh, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. Uh, when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks to you, Holy Father, for your holy name, which you have caused to dwell in our hearts and for the knowledge and the faith and immortality that you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be the glory forever. You, Almighty Master, created all things for your name's sake and gave food and drink to humans to enjoy so they might give you thanks. But to us, you have graciously given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through your servant. Above all, we give thanks to you because you are mighty. To you be the glory forever. Amen.
Uh, today, as we leave, remember that God is the God of the living and to live into that hope. So go in peace.